So this is a painting uh, I'm working on right now. It's uh, it's a small work on panel. Um, I kind of came to this image of a of a Hessian soldier who's dying. He's laying back. You could tell it's kind of its final final moments. Um, and I started just making objects that might surround him when he's passing away. What are the things uh, that were either important to him or had no significance to him, but just happened to be around him and now are taking on significance because these might be the last things he's seeing before he shuts his eyes for the last time. Hello, welcome back to AMREV 360. I'm Scott Stevenson, president and CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution. And the theme for today is a picture is worth a thousand words. Very excited to have as my guest today, Brooklyn-based artist, Les Cipher. Hello, Les, how are you? Hi there, Scott. Uh, <laughs> pleasure to be here. Very honored. Yeah, yeah. So tell us, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, uh, your background in art. You know, where, where did you grow up? Uh, when did you uh, start to work in visual media like this? And, uh, and then we definitely are going on to hear about your uh, actual working method and your, uh, the media that you work in. Um, so uh, born and raised in the New York area. So I've been here my whole life. Um, I've been in Bay Ridge for the past year. So it's a different part of Brooklyn. I used to be in Gravesend both kind of historical sections of Brooklyn. Um, yeah, I've been painting my whole life. Um, not painting, but making artwork anyway. My mother was an artist. Um, as long as I can remember, it's all I wanted to do. But if I was punished to my room as a child, I would go up and draw. That's what I would do. I didn't have a TV. I didn't have anything in my room except, you know, paper and, and pencils and stuff. So yeah, as long as I've been alive, I think I've been creating visual things. Um, nowadays I do, you know, I, I have a day job. I work in advertising technology, in fact. Um, and, uh, I think most artists probably in New York have a day job these days. I, I think it's important to like what you do as your day job, which I do. I think I need that human interaction and other side of the brain. Uh, but it is nice. I will say at the end of the day to just go down to my studio, um, clear my brain, even a half hour in my basement studio after a day of work kind of just resets me. And, uh, and that's, I pretty much paint every day. Hmm. Now, I'd love to talk a little bit about your medium. Um, I think you work in watercolor a lot, but it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex than that. And it's kind of a hodgepodge, hodgepodge approach to making art, I will say. So I use a lot of inks, acrylic based inks, um, liquid acrylic paints. Sometimes I'll use oil. Um, uh, I combine a lot of medium you probably shouldn't combine, quite frankly. Like I just, when I go to the art supply store, I'm like a kid in a candy store. So I buy all kinds of things that enable things to mix together. I like the fluidity of inks and the, the liquid acrylics because there's something you can't control about that. I kind of like, I'm not a person who's very tight in there usually and rendering things with a tiny, you know, the smallest brush in the world. I, I like a little bit of happy accidents and, and what happens when paint pools up and bleeds out. Um, so I paint, usually what I do is I have these panels, you'll see a few behind me here. Um, and they're wooden panels mostly. If I work really big, sometimes it's canvas. So I'll, I'll create grounds uh, on that. It's often abstract. It'll develop into something that maybe looks like a landscape sometimes. But parallel to that, I'm always, always painting figures always uh, on paper. And I like really thin papers, um, you know, rice papers, things that you can almost see through if you hold them up to the light. Um, and I like that for a couple of reasons, because if you, when you're painting with liquidy paint and ink, it kind of bleeds out a little bit. You lose a little control. It feels a little more alive to me. Um, but also when you're done painting it, if you flip the paper around, sometimes the reverse is more interesting than the, than the front. So there's, it gives you a lot of options. <laughs> and then what I often do is I end up cutting out these figures um, and I'll have dozens of these things laying around at any given time. And that's my technique in a nutshell. And how did that, I'm just curious how that evolved from your sort of where you started, you know, working, uh, were you, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, pe a pencil and paper guy sketching busts, you know, where, how did you evolve and land on this uh, sort of way of working? Uh, when I was a kid, I only drew with pencils, pretty much. Um, pencil on paper. Everything I did was, was pencil on paper. And uh, I remember in high school, there was a college nearby, SUNY Purchase uh, was not too far. And they had a printmaking class. I'd never done printmaking. I didn't know anything about it, but I went 
And I remember really getting into that, especially etching uh, and monoprints. And that kind of opened me up to be a lot looser about things and to realize there's some something about the spontaneity of, you know, a monoprint, you're, you're painting on glass often, you put the paper down, you have no idea what it's going to look like when you roll something over it and kind of press the paper into it. And then voila, you have the surprise. And there's, there's a lot etching, you have these acid baths where you would dunk your plate in, the longer you leave it, the more things would happen to it sometimes. So I, I love that process. Um, I never had access to those kinds of uh, materials after that, but it did open me up quite a bit. Um, and I think also there's an aspect to what I'm doing now with cutting out figures and different things that kind of brings me back to when I was a kid playing with soldiers and cowboys and Indians and all, all the things that I played with as a kid, which I did a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's fun. It's fun to like cut out, make your own figures and, and move them around in a scene and create a scene. And I usually have no idea where I'm going with a painting. I'll just cut them out. I'll just pick up a figure from there and a figure from there. And I've had figures laying around in my studio for three years I haven't used yet. I'm just waiting for the right painting to pop them in. Wow. So I'm curious um, in browsing your Instagram, your um, website, sort of looking at the larger body of your work. And I, I do want to come to the revolution here eventually in your focus uh, here over the last couple of years, but you've obviously have a fascination with the American West. Um, seems clear that you're, you're a history buff. And I'm just curious, um, sort of your approach, your inspiration, um, your, your interest in exploring these themes. Is there a thread that you can pull through all of those? So I, it actually started before the American Revolution stuff I've been doing for the last few years. I was doing cowboys, Wild West. I'll make it more broad than that. And I don't actually know what started me on that. I, I was definitely, I, I started thinking about being a child. I was really into, I grew up in the 70s, a boy in the 70s. And every boy probably had like a holster and a cowboy hat and little figures. Guilt, you guilty. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, you can relate. And it's, it's, I was, you know, I was thinking it's kind of hardwired into American boys in a way. Um, and it's, uh, I think there was a lot of things happening in, in the present at that time. Um, some unpleasant things, I would say, that kind of reminded me, like, why is this country so unique like this? Why are we, for better or for worse, we have these things about us that are unique. Uh, and I think of a lot of it is built up in this mythology that that's kind of hardwired into us. You know, what what is it about America that we have this mythology? How does it bake into how we you know experience things these days? Um, and then it kind of led to the American Revolution because my son, who's now 15, uh, was really into history, still is, and he was really getting to that time period. And I was like, this is really where it goes back to the birth of what the U.S. was really. Um, so we did a bunch of trips over the course of like a year and a half. We went to Philadelphia, of course, in 2017. We actually came there. I think it was just a few months after your museum opened. Uh, but we went to D.C. We went to Boston. We went up to Fort Ticonderoga, New York State. And, um, and I just took it all in. And the painting started to evolve to that. Um, and it was kind of the same thing. And I just see these paintings as I am. I wouldn't call myself a history buff where I, I know a ton. I know. a good deal of it for sure. Um, but I think as kids in this country, we know like the bullet points of history. We know, you know, Washington cut down a tree, wooden teeth, you know, like certain things, you know, Paul Revere wrote and said this thing, uh, but you don't know a whole lot more than that. And it seems like a very neat and tidy history um, when you're growing up, like 1776, it all happened in a year. They signed the Declaration of Independence, done, country, born. Uh, and then everybody went west, and that was it. Um, but it, it was so much, obviously, it's more spread out and messy than that. And that's history is actually very messy. And one of the things I loved about your museum, visiting it, which blew my mind, is is it kind of captured this sense of of personal history and humanity that I think I was lacking uh, in the history books when I was growing up. This one really spoke to me because um, it was a teenager number one, and it's, you don't really think of teenagers fighting uh, in these battles. Um, you think of these men, you know, all these paintings are usually of men. So he looked so young and kind of innocent when I saw that. And, and you know, some people would say, well, the Hessian was the, the enemy, you know, depending what side you're on, but it's like, no, this is just the boy, like on all sides, these were just innocent people. And even the folks, most of the folks fighting, if they weren't children, they were shopkeepers or cobblers or whatever, like people from all walks of life who were not professional soldiers were out there fighting. So this one spoke to me and I want to do it a little more close up. You'll notice a lot of my figures are far away. 
um, and don't always have faces. It's just more about the motion of things. But this one, I want to kind of zoom in a little bit. Um, and I'm not, you know, the coloring to me is more of an emotional approach to painting. It's not so realistically representing what the uniform's actual color was or anything. Um, the little boat that's over his shoulder there on the horizon, that's actually drawn by my son. Uh, and he, he's drawn like a bunch of those boats that I've been working into paintings more and more. Uh, but I thought it was really neat because it just felt like this is a guy that came across, you know, from a long distance away um, to do this really scary thing. So I wanted to put that boat in the background there. Um, so that's the Hessian. So Les, uh, th there's a work that's over your shoulder there, which obviously resonates with the three-dimensional work of art also produced by some Brooklyn-based artists at Studio Ice. And yeah, I'm just curious, uh, can, can you take us on a little tour of what we're, of what we're seeing there? <laughs> yeah. um, I was there in person uh, at your museum a few years ago. That particular tableau really did speak to me. And it, it kind of, what I love about that one um, is that it does capture a lot of the things I like to do in my own work, which is that sense of chaos there's a moment in history, I believe Washington is one of the figures, if I'm not mistaken in that. So right, breaking up the fight yeah. even. So um, I think it's great because it just has like this historical figure. It's got some chaos. It's got the messiness going on in there. Um, and that one really spoke to me. You know, I've kind of put it into a different environment as I always do. Well, it's all a stream. Uh, sometimes, yeah, I think we as historians try to put, uh, you know, brackets around periods and, and this sort of thing, but uh, it's not the way people experience history. It's, uh, you know, generations overlap and uh, this is not such a distant period of time, actually. Well, Les Cipher, thank you for being with us today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Very excited to see where you go next with your artwork. And I certainly hope uh, that we'll see some of it in person here at the Museum of the American Revolution uh, really soon.